Okay, I think we are live. Uh, I hope so. Uh, dear people on Facebook and YouTube, let us know if you cannot see us or hear us. Uh, I would wouldn't like to talk to an empty virtual space. Um, good morning, Elahe. Uh, good morning to those who are in your time zone. Uh, good evening to those who are in my time zone. Uh, good night to all the people who are sleeping somewhere else. Uh, welcome to Sofa Talk. Sofa Talk uh, is a is a series of meetings organized by Minority Rights Group International that I have an honor to to moderate. Um, there is always with me on the virtual Sofa Talk an inspiring lady. Today we have with us uh, uh, Elahe. Uh, I don't want to make a mistake in your name. Um, you are joining us from Los Angeles today. Well, Arizona. Arizona. Yes. So far away, uh, distance between you and me far away. Uh, I always try to invite here to those meetings a lady, lady who inspire me in some way, who force me to think who I would like all of you to get to know. Uh, it's always a lady with minority or indigenous background, uh, very often with not easy experiences of migration or statelessness, a person that can share her story, um, her path, uh, a person from whom we can learn um, and also get ideas how we in our countries, in our cultures, in our groups, can act. Um, in the past, on this sofa talk, I had ladies like Maria Ohir Gorieva, and with whom I was talking with uh, about indigenous peoples in Russia. You can all find the previous sofa talks on uh, social media and website of, of Minority Rights Group International. I had Angelica, with whom I was talking about Afro-Colombian challenges about Black heritage in South America. I had Zahra, very talented painter, um, who was born in Kuwait to a stateless family. I had Eden Fine Day from the First Nations in Canada, a songwriter. So variety of women, they have in common this that you really want to listen to their stories. And I can tell you, today uh, we have with us Elahe. Uh, her nickname is Eli Shakiba. She used to use both her name and her nickname in different moments of her life. Soon you will know why. Um, Elahe is an Iranian lady who studied engineering, architecture, who is an artist, journalist, and activist. This is how I mainly see you. Uh, I had this opportunity to, to meet you a few weeks ago in Geneva. Um, Minority Rights Group was uh, co-organizing an international competition for minority artists. Uh, and you were the one uh, who went on the stage because of the honorable mention. Uh, your art made you come to Geneva. This was the moment when we met. Um, I will read a little sentence from the judges panel of this competition about your art. Um, the judges panel was impressed by the remarkable commitment of the artist to explore minority issues from an intersectionality perspective. Zivardar has dedicated herself to shed light on the denial of rights and discrimination facing minority asylum seekers and migrants. The judges panel highlighted the strong impact that Zivardar's thought-provoking paintings can have in societies where migrants, in particular women and children, face multiple forms of discrimination on the migration roads and at the borders. Um, you will not see it very well here in the catalog of the of the winners of the competition. There are some of the art pieces of Elahe. And I would like to start with it. Um, what is art for you, Elahe? 
Hello. Firstly, good morning, Anna. Thank you very much for the introduction. And let me mention that you, Anna, yourself are such an inspiring, powerful woman that it was such an honor to meet you in Geneva this year, a few weeks ago. That painting is called uh, Judgment. And the description of the painting is poetic, but it refers to my feeling about the judgmental comments and messages receiving from Australian government and even some people like at the bottom of my activism <laughs> that were judging us that why did, why did you come to our country, go back to your country after I sought asylum from Australia and was detained by Australia on the remote island of Nauru. That painting was painted in the detention center. And I believe it was the third painting of my series of paintings named for the industrial complex. Each painting depict real stories of my experiences as uh, an asylum seeker in Australia's offshore detention center. So a tool, a tool to express what you went through exactly at the painting at the time when i started that and even before that in iran painting to me was uh, a tool or a, a method of therapy and uh, it was actually included in my final thesis at the university of architecture to proposing a facility that offers art different forms of art as they of therapy open to public well make it short uh, that's what I started practicing inside detention, as I always practiced to art as a form of resistance. And also to move on from the nightmares that I was dealing with inside detention center. And then after that, uh, I, I involved them in my activism to raising awareness, to sharing that with people, talking about my experiences, emotion, even nightmares, and to raise awareness. So art was with you uh, through all your life, not only now, yeah. not in detention center, but also back home in Iran. You come from Iran, uh, a country in the Middle East, surrounded by seven different countries, not easy location, um, a lot of mix of cultures, uh, different ethnic groups living together, Azeris, Kurds, Balakh, um, Arabs, Turkmen, there are also uh, religious minorities uh, which are being, which are facing discrimination, prosecution. Yes. Being a woman oh is not God, easy in Iran, as we know very, very well. Uh, if you don't mind, let's go back to Iran for a moment. Could you tell us a bit, where have you grown up? How was your childhood? How, how did it look like? Uh, from what kind of family are you? Well, I'm from a middle class family uh, from the south of Iran, Khuzestan. I'm from Ahwaz, a city actually, uh, the, the, the state that is in border with Iraq and was directly involved with the uh, Iraq-Iran war for eight years. And I was born at the middle of war. And my, actually my first, um, my first artistic approach in life started from primary school there was a bunker for the wartime in our primary school that we used to practice theater in the bunker, you know? Uh, so um, the manager of this school would bring like art, art coach, like theater coach, some famous theater actors. At the time they were most comedian. Mm -hmm. And they would come and we had some uh, theater workshop, practicing theater, musical in a bunker. So you can see where does it come, this this way of uh, that I'm used to using art as a therapy. You know? As an expression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, and then I was addicted to theater. And in my teenagehood, uh, I was, I spent all my teenagehood in theater society. Like I followed the coach outside of the school. I love theater. I want to be involved with the theater society. And that's the beginning of uh use of theater to express and to learn i don't know theater is everything theater is psychology it's uh, politics 
it's architecture, it's painting, music, it's everything. I, I would describe it as like a complex that you can learn and experience different form of art. And uh, that was amazing. So I'm going to study art architecture in Iran. And I left Iran in 2013 at the age of 28. So please ask me question between this period in Iran whenever you want. No, I'm just thinking about reality of life uh, in Iran. And you talk about theater and all this political expressions and freedom, yes? Art and theater means yeah. freedom. And we know that freedom is not exactly the the easiest thing to achieve uh, when you are a young person in Iran. Could you tell us a bit how, how the reality looked like for you? Yeah, the reality looked like, like it's depend on the, actually at the time it depended on the government and powers. For example, there were much more freedom when we had like reformers and government it's very complicated like the two major parties that are like right wingers conservative and the reformers in iran it's a kind of like economically right wingers are more left but in terms of social issues they are very conservative mm -hmm. but the reformers are economically more right winger <laughs> and more into capitalism but like in terms of freedom of speech or artistic activism, they are more into uh, democracy. So this is a very complicated situation. As an artist, when the reformer were on power, we had more freedom and everything was perfect, but it could cause you more problem actually, because you would receive that freedom, you could speak out and then the government would change and you could be in trouble for what, whatever you've done during the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not easy. It's totally not easy to be a woman in Iran. It's easier if you are coming from a religious conservative family. But in my case, I had a very uh, enlightened open mind father. That is not something usual in Iran. And I had freedom. I was never in trouble for any of my right as a girl. A, a little girl, a young girl, a teenage girl, and it was a contrast, the, the kind of feeling of, oh, it's different, what I have in home, uh, between the response that I received from society. It was more extreme when I moved to the other city to study, because in my city, in south of Iran, because of the, uh, and they mix with Western culture because of like Western employee who used to work there. Uh, the, the situation in environment is more open-minded. Uh, are you hearing me because your video is frozen? I can hear you. Oh, are you back? Good. Um, so when I moved to the other city, Kashan, to study architecture, Kashan is an amazing ancient city in terms of architecture, but very conservative, small city in Isfahan that are mostly more religious people. It was the first time that I realized, oh, I'm in trouble as a woman in compare to men, because mm -hmm. these people even don't like a, a girl who goes to the other city alone and study and live independent. Like I was 18, had my own studio, was a student, and it wasn't acceptable by the society at the time in that city. Well, that was the beginning that I started understanding, oh, this is discrimination. This is like, why these people are acting like this? It was totally different culture. And as I grow up, I get more involved in the society as a professional architect, trying to be in the market, dealing with other men. Well, there are a lot to discuss. It's not just about the uh, discrimination in terms of policies within the governments. I'm talking about the society, the men in the market in my professional life that I didn't have great experiences. There are a lot of experiences of being harassed and uh, or mm, facing discrimination in my my uh, career 
that was really difficult to carry on, you know, after, after a long time, over the years, and other things will be added to it, and you don't know how many things should be carried on. Should you be dealing with you, the abuse of your rights with the government, for example, the ban on my online blog, not not receiving permit to have a music concert even only for women mm -hmm. that was also denied or, or or permit to publish my poetry book nothing i had no right because of oh you should change your idea you should change this you should change it. you cannot be yourself well it will be added to the society and a lot of other things that makes you feel unsafe and not belonging to that environment which is such an important That's feeling important for each of us right yeah exactly so are we reaching the point that i left iran or we're still going to talk about iran what was the moment when you left what was the the, the moment uh -huh. when you took the final decision the moment that I took the final decision was very emotional and crazy moment because I'm not a kind of person that just Elaha, one second. I cannot hear you. Uh, I don't know if it's only me. Um, could anybody watching us on Facebook tell us uh, if we can hear? No. Oh, oh, oh yeah, now? Man. Yes, you are back. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, please go back two sentences. Thank you. Oh, it says like my internet connection is unstable. I don't know what's going on. I'm sorry. Well, uh, where were we? I was talking about the moment, the emotional moment. And I was explaining that at the end of the day, I was in prison. I'm not a kind of person that flee just because of the fear of going to prison or even because of the fear of being killed or murdered. I was receiving like threatening messages by uh, anonymous people whom I didn't know and also online comments on my blog, my social media, but mm -hmm. again from unknown people. But again, that wasn't the, the, the like, last shot last thing mm -hmm. that made me go i was dealing with all of those forms of discrimination and fear and harassment but my father got sick i should say my best friend got sick he got mm -hmm. parkinson and there were no medicine in terms of medicine, we have been dealing with a terrible situation in Iran as a consequence of sanctions. You know, everyone says sanctions are not include like medical services or medicine, but that does when the economy, when the bank, Iranian National Bank is under the sanction, other countries are scared of selling medicine. Mm -hmm. So I had, I remember that I was just crying like a, miserable desperate person in the street from this pharmacy to the other pharmacy contacting these people to that the other people to find medicine for my father and it was nothing even my contact my network from the whole country even tehran couldn't find that medicine and it wasn't just my father it was the same issue for patients who were dealing with cancer even insulin for insulin finding insulin such such an important and simple medicine was impossible in Iran for people who were dealing with diabetes because of the sanctions. So it wasn't a thing that put pressure on the government. It was directly targeting people and sick people who needed the medicine. So, and at the time people used to go to Australia. I didn't have plan to leave the country. I hadn't thought of leaving the country. And one of my former colleagues who had problem with the TV, as I mentioned you before, I was Alicia Kiba because, because it was illegal to have like a, a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. And I just asked him that how how did you reach there and how that how does it did it take? I have to go and I don't have time to plan and I I, I just need to leave the country. I just need to go. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and my friend gave me advice that uh, like how can I do that and people to contact and go from Indonesia and how to like go there and it, the whole process would take like one to two months in, in center. and I say that's the great solution it it solved all of my problem finally I reached 
a country where I we treated uh, as a human as it should be yeah that's what I you thought no I had exactly I had no idea actually the abuse of women right in Australia and, and actually the violence against women in Australia I learned a lot about all of that inside the detention center after I was actually following the news in Australia before that I just knew my colleague who had problem it was easy for him and maybe I can do that too but it didn't happen I stuck in that prison and two years later my father passed away while I was in prison and trauma after trauma after trauma but I can see the world much better now. It's more clear, you know. I can I can see the reality more clear and much better now. But it's been a very painful and traumatic way of receiving that knowledge. There is there there is no way for us, I think, to imagine uh, what 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 you went through. And you know, when I think about a lot of different Iranians leaving Iran because of very different reasons and going different directions. Yours is also very special. So you didn't decide to go west. You had this idea you will get to Australia and you got on the boat to take you to Australia, right? Yes, I I traveled to Indonesia and everything happened so quickly within a week. I I I got into a flight to Indonesia and then I was there for 15 days, two weeks. And then I got into a boat. I traveled by boat around like uh, 38 to 40 hours. And then we got to Christmas Island. We spent the first night on the boat because the camp was closed and they said you should stay. The Navi people of Australia, Border Force, I was a new force, I think. Then they told us that we, need, we should stay in that boat. And next day, we entered the detention center and it was all going to happen. So that was that was the day when you thought you will arrive to a new, safe, happy that destination. Was a day we were not seeing, you know, we made it, you know, because the biggest deal at the time, we had no idea who was expecting us. We thought the most important thing, because in Indonesia, there is a lot of problem to make it. A lot of people are stuck there over the years. A lot of people are just ripped off by people a smuggler that steal their money and don't do anything for them or will send them with a broken boat, with broken engine that doesn't make it. Mm -hmm. So we were the lucky ones. It was just 38 hours. And despite the difficulties that we had, we knew how lucky we are and we were so happy. We we're still alive. Ocean were so kind and welcoming with us. But Australia wasn't. Uh, how, how big was the boat? How many people came with you? It, uh, I don't know how to call it. It wasn't that big. We were 60 people. Again, we were so lucky because people usually come with fishing boats, mm -hmm. like 150, 120 people with a fishing boat that is extremely crazy, dangerous. Yeah. But again, we were so lucky because we were like with the boat rider. As we call it, yeah, yeah, yeah the captain mm -hmm, who, who yeah, was able to to to. Captain team who were like local people from Indonesia. We were like sixty four, maybe sixty five people, and it wasn't the fishing boat. It was, a kind of, um, like transport boat for for business. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm not sure about the exact name in English, but it was bigger than fishing boat, mm -hmm. and it was in two level. And you arrived safely to Christmas Island, and then what? Oh, and then we were there. We had we were still happy for a while. We were happy, and we were thinking, oh, how we are going to stay here for two months because it was a little tiny detention camp. So at that uh, moment, you thought you will stay there two months and then yeah, you will we were, end up in Australia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were talking about offshore, about Naru and Manus, but we could never believe it. Never believe it that Australia actually will do that because like to women, to children, 
why should they do that even like if they think because before that they were talking about that and even in 2012 they had sent some single men to Nauru but it hadn't happened to it had also happened to families and women and children in uh, like in, in the decade before yes oh but at the time heard about it you know nobody had the when I was in Iran, I could imagine like another country be racist to our refugees. You hear in the news, you you know, and the, the through the history. But all you think about Australia is the land of beautiful beach, beer, and kangaroos. That's mm -hmm. that's the idea that we had. I think you are you there? It's frozen. Oh, you're back. So that's that's the picture that we had of Australia. So we, we never believed that. Um, even when we got to Nauru, even when we got to Nauru, we thought this is a temporary thing. This is an election thing because of the fight between two parties in Australia. And everyone would say something, but we didn't believe it. Like even after the third year, they said, you're going to stuck here for 10 years. We still didn't believe it. I can't believe how loyal we have been to this picture of australia of of like human rights in a western country and mm. we still didn't so it's uh, ella to um to make uh people who listen to us uh, imagine um uh, you've been for a bit on the christmas island and then you were taken to the republic on, of nauru which is an island a small island i don't know 20 square kilometers, something like this, uh, 4,000 or more than 4,000 kilometers from Australia, right? It's not just next to Australia. It's far, far, far out on the Pacific Ocean. I guess, oh, I guess most of the people of this world never heard the name Nauru. Um, yes. What is this place? Before we get into how it looks like what is it how come australia decided to do something so different than other countries yeah. about the timing i arrived in christmas island in august 2013 august 8 8th of august 2013 and i was transferred to nauru uh, i believe uh, in January 21st, around that, 2014, mm -hmm. after like five, six months being there. Uh, well, in Christmas Island, things were better. It was more prison because it had like those ironic automatic door, the officers, the Serco was actually managing the detention center, the same company that is working in the UK, Asylum Secure Detention Center. That's an interesting point, I think. And then we were transferred to Nauru, a tiny island in the Pacific Ocean that Australia already had destroyed with over mining, mining phosphate. And they were actually building this prison and then this asylum seeker detention center in Australia to make it up as a compensation to Nauru by, by like providing jobs. And they're providing their, jobs. Jobs, providing jobs mm -hmm. and jobs and money into Nauru and paying the government to run this prison and detention center. And also they promised Nauru and to build them uh, hospitals, schools, street lights, because they have nothing. Nauru itself is suffering from extreme poverty, has a corrupt government. And there is nothing, there is not even an actual store that you can go and shop. They have nothing on the island so that that is about Nauru before the tension center so it's a tiny tiny island in the middle of ocean and huge Australia is using it as they want to yes with mining yeah, like, and also yeah. with building mm -hmm. they already have destroyed the island and they like there are like some idea that say the, the island will be sink in, in 20 or 10 years because of extracting too much um, phosphate. Phosphate is the only industry and the only income of the island. And uh, that is true. 
you arrive to Nauru, where you spend years of your life. And I read this little poem of yours. I would like to read here before we get to how, how did it look like there. So you wrote, empty, numb, confused, lost. Who are we? Who am I? No one. What are we? What am I? Nothing. A number? Maybe. The number of a boat. IVL 57. This is my name inside the prison, IVL 57, that actually our boat were named, they named each boat by like this kind of initial uh, letters. Mm -hmm. Our boat was IVL, and I was one of the last people within those 64, 65, I was number 57, and I waited to, for other families and children to go give their name and get into the tensions, and I was like, at the end. IVL 57 was my name. And the prison itself, the, our detention center was built on a former phosphate mine, and it was a toxic land itself. And there were no building, there were no wall, there were no facilities. We were living in nylon tents in extreme uh, hot weather of Nauru Island. It's extremely hot and humid. And this nylon plastic tent would end up being covered by toxic mold. So there were a lot of health hazards in our detention center, while our basic needs were weaponized against us. Needs such as what? Simple as what? The island doesn't have one. Or at the time, even if we had, it was so weaponized against us. For example, Shower time was two minutes. It didn't matter if it was a little kid that her mother is trying to wash her head or if it's an adult, it was two minutes. And if, if, if it would, wait, would take two minutes and one second, the officer outside of the shower room would close the tap and close the water on you. And it was always kids screaming with burning eyes and half the shower and they would laugh at us. This is just one example of the way that they would weaponize our needs against us. Mm, how big is this place? How many people stay there? How many security people are around? Just that we can imagine. They had promised jobs. There were so many security officers. That was the job that they had promised to local people. But <coughs> I'm sorry, the place was a small. The detention center was uh, divided to different people. Actually, single men with no family were located in another detention center called um, OPC2, stands for Offshore Processing Center 2. We were staying in OPC3, Offshore Processing Center 3, belong to family, children. Uh, and like our detention center, the one that I was, was like a few meter far from the family because I was staying in South area. South area stands for single adult female. Mm -hmm. And we were divided by male and female and numbers. There is no humanity. There is not men and women. It's male and female and it's numbers. So trying to remove any kind, any simple sign of humanity that could like relate us to being a human. In their behavior, in their uh, rules, in everything, that was the idea, the fundamental of idea of building that detention center. Yeah, and it, I, it's I, not an accident, uh, right? It's a systematic no, decision. I, I, I studied that as an architect a lot to to analyze the the, the environment, the architecture, the way that even the way that the, the officers and security guards are located to scan us mm -hmm. or to answer our request. It was all designed to mentally torture and break down the details. No, wh whatever I was reading about this place, it really feels like designed for this designed yeah. for for humiliation for torture for racism um from which countries 
there were people. It was designed for TV. Are you hearing me? Yes. And they were obviously um, exhibiting that and promoting that. I was inside the detention center when people from Denmark came to visit the detention center to copy that for their own country, for the asylum seekers, like right winger from see Denmark. It as an example. Yes, yes. As a, even before UK, Denmark was one of the first country that was thinking of that. I believe, I, if I'm not wrong, Italy is, is talking about that right now. But at the time also, Italy was one of the country that I was thinking of, oh, reviewing what Australia is doing to repeat after that. So UK Rwanda deal is not the first one before that. It had a history of promotion and exhibiting and exporting that kind of business plan. And they came to visit it, see how this design is going to work. Uh, I think they were happy with that. It's cheap. They can steal as much as they want. It comes from uh, people, tax money, and it goes to their pockets. And they provide Norwegian with jobs. And they also humiliate and destroy our lives. And they will make it an example for other people who are trying to come to Australia. They spend millions of dollars, billions, if I'm not wrong, to advertise that border force of Australia, to advertise that that don't come to Australia or you will be detained like these people in this mm -hmm. detention center. So it See? was a showcase. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Can, you, can you tell me how such a day looks like in a place like this? Well, it's mostly most of the day. At the beginning, firstly, at the beginning, people had more power, had more motivation, had more hope. Like they would try to spend their time by any way that they can, like studying English. I would organize English classes in my tent and people would come and like, <laughs> I did. You try to do something positive to spend the time, but just let mm. the time go. And but the the hope was going away as time was going by, and as we realized that this is serious and there is no end on this. This is just indefinite detention, and they say you you have to stay here forever. They this is what they were telling you. That you yes. were forever. Oh, yeah. There is a video that Scott Morrison, the prime minister at the time, sent us into inside the detention center that told us that you're going to stay here forever or you should go back to your country. You have to go back to your country or you'll stay here forever. And <laughs> I actually have put the video in my 3D model of the detention center because I'm, I have made a 3D model of the detention center with architectural software for the documentary film that I'm making. Mm -hmm. And at one part, I actually had revealed the scene that Scott Morrison sent the video. And in our South area, like women were, we were watching like a video that what is he saying? The reaction of people like, oh, he's, he's really saying that you're going to stay here forever. Uh, I, I, uh, I, will, I, I will come back to your um, uh, documentary feel that you are working at. So let's. Let's start with the, this documentation. You managed to get a phone with camera to be able to make pictures inside. At the beginning, it wasn't a phone with camera. It was a game tool that kids play with. And it was very expensive <laughs> inside the detention center. It had like a three megapixel camera on these game tools, little game tools. And you know, the way that you deal inside prison it with cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, That's the was price you pay. Mm -hmm. It was I, I I received that in return of twenty packets of cigarettes. That was that was very expensive price for such a thing. Elaha, I'm a bit afraid I lost you again. Uh... I see you talking. I don't hear you. Let's wait a second because we don't want to miss your sentences. I am sorry. Oh, now it's good. Now it's good. No, no, don't yeah, worry. Yeah, we yeah, have what we have. Connection. I don't know what's going on with my connection. It was fine, but today it says all the time. Well, uh, documentation. Yeah. How did you? How did you even have this idea to start doing this? Well, I was doing sketches. 
I was doing the sketches and uh, uh, of like detention center since so Christmas. Artist uh, and architect doing <laughs> their job, yes. Yes, and it was actually at the beginning it wasn't like it was just raising awareness, and then I say before that let me go back and correct it. I I, I just remember before that. When I left Indonesia, even in the boat, I did filming inside the boat with my camera, with my, mm -hmm. my phone. That was mm -hmm. a very simple phone. And I was thinking of making a short documentary, short video of how I reached my freedom on the ocean and how nice everything was. And I made it so different uh, what I was thinking that was so childish. And food. So, but inside the prison, I said, "Oh, I am still going to do that, but with real topic." I still had no idea that how long I'm going to stay here. But I just started doing this. It was another thing that you start doing and thinking of something in the future to survive. To another keep something of... you 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 aim for. Exactly, another form of using art as just a form of resistance. I'm gonna make a documentary. Maybe I've been here to do this. You know, you try to find sort of what I because it was a very common question between people that why me? Why, why am I here? Mm -hmm. Because they were like rebuilding a kind of hell for us and trying to give in, putting that idea into our mind that I, we are senior. We had committed mm -hmm. a big crime to attempt to. We were like entering Australia and everything, everything was designed to transfer that idea, to plant that seed into our brain. And, so, and this, this question, why me, this comes from the situation that not 100% of people being on the boats would end up in Nauru, right? There were people no, no, who went it somewhere randomly, else. It was just randomly taken and actually mm. it was mostly... In many cases, the no offense to those who didn't come to Nauru because in some cases really like serious medical issue involved, or I don't know, they tried so hard or whatever. It was randomly. Mm. But a lot of people who were calm and had more patience were within those people who were transferred to Nauru. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those who can tolerate more needed to keep. Oh, um, are you getting me? Oh, good. So, yeah, it was totally randomly. It was totally randomly. And people would think, why I'm here? And the same person who came to Australia by boat with me is in Australia, has mm -hmm. received temporary. Yeah. And and this unknown. Visa and they are living their life. But... And this... when I started filming and the photography in the daylight, in the daylight, mm -hmm. I could record good photos, but I still didn't have plan to share them. And I thought... Okay, in like maybe in one year, in two years, they don't think of six years. I'll be out. <laughs> this is something I was thinking a lot when I was reading about your story, that this is also a way of torturing people when there is no deadline, when you don't know what to expect. This is one of the one of the ways of making people get crazy. That was the biggest thing. That was the biggest pain that living in limbo with no future, that there is no end to this, was the worst thing that was really torturing people mentally. And how the day was, we were, the first question was this, how we would spend the day. We ended up for like next uh, couple of years, people ended up sleeping. They were prescribed strong sleeping pills and medicine. In many cases, addictive medicine, such as tramadol, just to make them sleep and quiet and under control. You don't have to do anything. You just need to stay here and we make money at your detention center. So we ended up being asleep. I was very busy doing my activism, especially after the death of my father. You feel you've lost everything. Everything that you were trying to avoid already has happened. What can I do? I can just fight. Well, other people have hope, you know, just give some meaning to my life because my life was meaningless. And I didn't want to look at myself as such a loser and prefer oh to stay oh right there. This is, this is absolutely the last, the last description I would ever give you a loser. So it, it must have taken a lot of courage to to make those pictures, to make those drafts, 
but you were also um, taking part in campaigns about what is happening in Nauru. How how did it? How did you do that from inside? Well, uh, I started making short videos after the death of Omid Masum Ali, the young man. I explained in our meeting in in in, in Geneva. When Maybe you can to... say shortly for for, uh, for for people who listen. When Abishal came to visit Nauru to to visit our detention center, and when they went to visit refugee camp at the time. Uh, well, let me explain that that for first three years I was imprisoned inside detention center. The whole island was a detention center mm -hmm. because we, and the island, Nauru Island, is not like other country that you go and buy a ticket and fly or or get into a ship and go to other. No, no, no. Transportation is a big issue. There are just very limited flights from Nauru to Australia, maybe um, uh, Fiji. Mm -hmm. And they are all controlled. It is not like you can just go and get into a flight and flee this country. You can't flee Nauru. You can flee mm -hmm. your country wherever you are, but you can't flee Nauru. So, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what, what was I talking about before that? I, I, I was curious. How did you get your courage to to be able oh. to share things yeah. outside of the camp? I started after uh, for first three years. I was inside prison. And for the next uh, three years, I was outside of prison uh, in in kind of uh, camps that they had built during during years. The construction mm -hmm. was done, and they were building this other camp for us to live in as refugees, living detention center and live in those. And the difference was that they were not tents; they were like uh, fabricated uh, container building containers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and it was good, you know, it was better than moldy tent and they had a con inside because we were living under the, the tent without any air con under extreme heat. See, just depicting a hell, a hell you should burn. You know, we were really burning under that. It was like a microwave built for human microwave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for the next uh, three years, I was outside and uh, I had received my money back from the property because when you get to the detention center, they get you everything that you have, your phone, your iPad, your mm -hmm. money, everything. And when you leave the prison, they will give it back to you. Mm -hmm. So I sent my money to my former colleague that I told you from Iranian TV who was in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I asked him to just with the like a thousand dollar that I had by me just one simple camera camera stand tiny microphone just to record interviews mm -hmm. not just do professional shooting outdoor it's just to this would be interviews. impossible with the security right it was impossible and to receive that it was itself a story like some translator interpreters Iranian interpreters who were in Naru like they would bring once the camera as they, they would, would smuggle it. things in mm -hmm. once the laptop once the stand like i had to wait for them to come differently then nobody like will think that oh these are like journalist equipment mm -hmm. where are you taking these things so after receiving that i started recording interview with people in my room in that refugee and i had those uh photos and videos from inside detention center recorded by those game tools that i mentioned i bought a cigarette so i started recording interview but i hadn't thought of publishing that yet i was thinking we'll do that when we get out of here it's dangerous mm -hmm. I think I lost you again. I really hope you will come back very soon. I'm sorry. Here we are. All okay, good. good. So you and official came to visit Nauru in, I believe it was 2015. It was a few months after I heard about the death of my father. And when they went to visit, I believe, Nibak camp, one of those refugees camp that they had built and transferred refugees from detention there. Omid Masum Ali, a very young Iranian man, refugee man, set himself on fire right in front of you and official. 
and that was a huge trauma for everyone. Mm -hmm. He he had like fifty percent burning. He he could survive, but they delayed transferring him to Australia for two days, and it was so dirty and unsafe what they had as hospital in Nauru, as I mentioned before, they had nothing. So he got infection in that toxic environment and they deliberately delayed him. They could transfer him by jet to Australia. They decided to not to save him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they deliberately delayed him to die to send us a message that even if you kill yourself, you won't get to Australia. And when they transferred him after that delay, Peter Dutton announced that after receiving treatment, he has to go back to Nauru. And he died. He was already dead. Whom, whom are you going to bring back to Nauru? And a few days after that, a Somalian young lady set herself on fire. It was a terrible, terrible situation. And the, the, the thought of suicide was going like, an epidemic between these detained and we are going to be detained here forever. Let's let's get rid of it. Let's kill ourselves. And when it happened, it was so dangerous. And I felt that I can do something. So I better stop just crying and this isolation from my father and do something. And maybe I escaped from that pain of the loss of my father to start my activism oh, action mm -hmm. and then i started making short videos the first one was the fact about omit about how he committed suicide and what happened that he died and then a couple of other videos for mother's day in australia and i interviewed all of those not all of those a few of those mothers inside detention center describing their lives mm -hmm. and after that uh, from ABC um, reached out to me and I worked for them recording uh, interviews with um, are you hearing me because your video is frozen I, I can hear you yeah sorry well and then I worked for ABC and other media channels as a camera operator actually because my camera as I mentioned was good it was like a Nikon D3 uh, 3200 so you became the correspondent inside yeah. the detention center. He couldn't receive his uh, let me let me explain that that uh, the journalists were not allowed to come to yeah. Nauru. They couldn't get visa. They had to pay eight thousand dollar for to receive the visa, and there were no guarantee that they will receive it. Only journalists from uh, right winger media in Australia, in Australia. were the government yeah they, they they were only allowed to come and record some propaganda and go back so that's how i got professionally involved with these campaigns and 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 yeah media correspondent work and thanks to this you also have a lot of materials from there uh, oh, yeah. that you are hopefully able to use uh, for your documentary um before we get to documentary, how did you get out of this hell? Well, I believe it was it, well, the, the, the first talk that I heard about the conversation of a deal between Australia and third countries. I actually started in 2016 that I worked for ABC and from the producer that the, the negotiation that were going on between these journalists and producers and campaign organizer and the government officials. They were saying, hold on, hold on, don't make more stories. We are negotiating with three countries, uh, United States, Canada, and New Zealand to send these refugees over there. So it was the first time that I heard about that before it will be announced in the media. I heard that from my colleagues. And then it was a long process. Our process started, I believe, in yeah, maybe in 2016, same year, and it was going on fine until President Trump won the election and brought the idea of Muslim ban, which actually wasn't the Muslim ban, it was targeting people's nationality yes. more than their religion. Between them, Iranians. 
Iranian Afghan refugees, like for Pakistani refugees at the time, were so lucky. They were not being rejected. They were Muslim, but there were no ban on them. It was like Iranian, Iraqi people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was targeting concrete. Afghanistan at the time it was uh, yeah Iranian Af um, Iraqi Syria refugees from the, uh, some some countries mm -hmm. that were under the ban, and it changed everything suddenly like within a day a lot of Iranian people were being rejected like I don't know tens of people hundreds of people in a day were receiving mm -hmm. rejected resolve from their process. And it was another nightmare because we were being hope. We were being given hope. Huge and hope of Australia. And the first transfer were actually done and people had left Nauru after years. And everyone was parking, being happy. We are finally going. And we are going to America. We're so happy. And then suddenly it happened and people were being rejected and it was another trauma. It was dealing with another trauma because the hope was taken away. Again. Every day they were being rejected. When I got my uh, positive results, it was in the, at the end of 2018. I came to America in February 2019, but I received my positive result that I've been accepted at the end of 2018. Uh, and at the time, it was the situation was so terrible that I felt guilty because I felt, oh, all of these people, all of these people are being rejected and I've been accepted. What's the difference? And I feel bad. And if I go, nobody will be here to cover the stories. And I sometimes I think that was the reason that I got, <laughs> that I was accepted. They just wanted to kick me out of the island. We don't need her here, you know? And Australia kept the promise, no? They, they said you will not get there. So they managed to have a deal that people would go directly to another country, yeah. not to Australia. I was actually, after that, even since I've been in America, I, it, it, I can't say that I've been targeted because of my activism by Australia, because many other former refugees of Nauru and Manus are in Australia, have been able to get visa and travel to Australia. But despite many invitations from Australia's universities and organizations who had invited me to go to Australia in 2023, my application was rejected with no reason. Well, with, with no explanation. That so no, you you no. you tried, yes. You were invited. You wanted to go. You cannot uh, go. Yes, I tried. I was invited by Amnesty International, by like a Doc Society, other amazing Australian organization to go there and have a summit, a professional summit for mm -hmm. my document. So my yeah, it was rejected, and I couldn't do that. But other refugees, even Beruz Buchani and other female refugees who are in America, they have traveled to Australia. It was just me. Maybe that means you've done something right, you know? This is what, <laughs> what, what, what I believe in. You Thank want you. to go to Australia to talk about your documentary. Uh, we are getting short in time, but I still would love people to hear um, what is the idea behind. You put together your architecture skills, uh, your design, your uh, documentation that you managed to do through all these years, uh, what will it be? I'm sure it will go out. Uh, tell us what it is. We just luck because it's been 10 years now. Because like the first footages you see in the you see in this documentary, the footages that are recorded in the boat with that phone and the, all those photos and videos that recorded with that tool and the interview as well as the painting that are involved with a form of animation of telling the stories in, in, within. Actually, paintings are a kind of, I'm thinking of using them as a doorway between chapter to chapter of the documentary because it's been a long time. And also using the 3D model that I created of the detention center because it doesn't exist anymore to explain how it looked like, how was the detention center like. It's so still you much as a, better than, it's still as, much better than <laughs> as, as a as a professional architect, uh, you are able to to build all the structures to show in the 3D model how the place looked like. Yeah. It's it's still, as I mentioned, it's still more clean and better than what it was in real life. 
but it still can transfer the feeling. And the, the biggest challenge that I have had is the memories. Like, I don't remember exactly because it was changing through the time. The construction was the main money-making tools that uh, Australia had. Yeah. So the detention center was changing over the time. And I need to pick a period of time to build that model because it will be different in another time. Mm -hmm. And to remember how it looked like, because some area of the detention center, we were not allowed even to enter. I had to share my model with former detainee and ask them, how do you remember? What was at this corner, you know? And sometimes former detainee are totally avoiding looking at the model. They try and they see, oh, it makes me sick. I can't look at this. So it was very challenging to find some this is this is some people who, who who will to contribute without getting sick so you you wanted to consult it with other people but here we touch the secondary trauma and people going back to those places within your 3d um presentation uh but you managed to consult it with different people yes it's not just your My memory friend. it's a it's, it's... Some of my friends actually have been always supportive and try to help, even if they are suffering, they want to help, but it's been really challenging. And no, people, people should see it. People should, should hear about it. And uh, I'm wondering how, how can we support your project? Oh, thank you so much. You've already supported the, <laughs> my work a lot. Thank you. But uh, this is not just a documentary. We are planning to have a big exhibition next year, hopefully in Australia. A VR exhibition when, when, where people can actually walk in through the model, you know, virtually have a tour inside the detention center. And I'm actually considering of rebuilding the model with other softwares that makes it more realistic and I can mm -hmm. make it dirty as it was, not this clean. Because, you know, the software that I've already used are very really like a kind of software that I meant to create luxury buildings. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the, the, the exhibition will include the model interviews everything hopefully in july 19th 2024 in australia i will keep you updated on that and there will be probably another documentary related to particularly this exhibition because there are a lot a lot of material and uh, like my my partners my uh People who are collaborating with me on these projects always have creative ideas that we can separate them, the documentary, the play, theater play, maybe the animation or, or written pieces. We need to separate them uh, in a way that is more tangible for people mm -hmm. and they can understand it more. And all of that with the aim of raising awareness. Now, this is your your mission, the raising awareness and and speaking about what you went through, but also what are the solutions of governments that just shouldn't be taking place. I, I read your letter to, to the government of UK uh, when the ideas of the UK-Rwanda deals were published. Um, you know very well what it means to be sent to a faraway place that is closed and as we said designed for putting people down for taking away away the hope for treating them in a way they should never be treated um i was i was very impressed that you still have energy to fight for you know other places um what what gives you power to do that Ah, uh, honestly, I don't know myself. <laughs> Sometimes it's not that I'm always powerful and I always feel the same strength that I had. There's a lot of up and down in my activism. Sometimes I'm really desperate. That's and normal. Think, That's normal. I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. But there is always some spark in the absolute darkness that comes out. I believe in that. That something will come, you know. And I try to keep this within me to always think positive, always look at the positive part of something that comes up. I don't know for how long I'm able to keep doing that, but uh, but I'm trying. And also people who join me during my activism, they have a huge role in that, you know. 
when you have people with you who are working with you when i'm desperate when i feel they can hold my hand and take me up again this is very important that's why i think in having more human interaction being more involved like team up with people mm -hmm. like-minded people who have same concerns and in terms of rwanda deal it's in somehow it can be even worse even if it's not worse it could be the same as naro because naro was isolated uh, impoverished country but there is there are a lot of concerns uh, of military confrontation between rwanda and congo and i do not understand like refugees uh, if you are following international rule the first the first priority should be providing them with safety a safe place how a war zone can be a safe place safe for place. it's gonna cost billions of dollars for uh british government to 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 do that process and i i don't know how they are going to afford that with the current situation the, in the global economy situation uh, it's just crazy unsafe and it's i think it's aimed to fail from now i don't know so this is it. this is what uh, australia is doing with nauru yes um ex exporting exporting the challenge yes we will not deal with it. We put the attention center there. This is I what think you... they don't want to be alone in this. They are like they are looking for partnering crimes that we were not the only one who did this, you know. <laughs> because I don't know what kind of benefit they could have out of it that they are like exporting this. Mm. Well, it's money to build all those places, is as as you also said, the... giving jobs to the local people, but I think the biggest part of it is outsourcing the situation um, yeah. but what what do you think should be done instead of it how to how to do it in the proper way i think the system was going to work before all of this well like when before promoting all of these fears that refugees are danger or potential terrorists they are going to come and take over your country how many thousand we were that we were trying to go to Australia and it, actually sometimes I think because they did it to the indigenous people of Australia they have this mentality that people who seek asylum and come here are going to do the same thing that we did to these people you know it's a good point <laughs> in in Farsi we say kafar hamera bekishe khot penda that means you do something wrong you think everyone is planning to do that you know you think you do something bad to people you think everyone is going to do the same to you I think that's what's happening here. And the system was working. They, they, I think countries have to follow international law. Uh, the United Nations, like charts in terms of uh, defining who are asylum seekers, who are refugees, and how they should be treated. This is, uh, this is a good point about this. Uh, societies that do something not rise to minorities and migrants being afraid that they will become minority themselves one day. Because yeah. if you think about it, if if a country creates a system where minorities are treated as they should be, those systems shouldn't be afraid of becoming minority because they also would be treated right. But this is a this is a tricky, tricky thing. Um Elahe, last question. How how can we follow you? How can we follow your your artistic work, your future documentary? Uh, where can we see uh, what you will be doing next year? Because I I'm more than sure that you are not stopping. Yes. Uh, thank you for asking that. Um, um, you, you can follow me on Instagram. This is the most active social media that I have right now. I've been very busy recently dealing with so many crazy things. So I would I would prefer to promote my website, but it will be updated soon. And hopefully people can uh, like... Um, um, register to receive update from my website, like mm -hmm. mass email. And, and so for now, the name of the Instagram account is? It's Shakiba Production. Yeah, let me, because there are different, but let me, I'm sorry, let me bring it. No, no, uh, we, will, we will post it under the, under okay. the video. 
Okay, this is Shakiba Productions store, and also there is another Shakiba Production that uh, will publish more publication articles, bring more updates on my activism. But the store is where people can go and actually purchase the copies of paintings or see the paintings. And yeah, I'll keep to updated, keep you updated on my website and other social media pretty soon, hopefully. I will definitely follow your work. Uh, I would like to be able to support in any way. I think that you have this this incredible, you know, will to to share what you went through and and to turn it into something positive. Um, and we 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 all should support what you are doing because you shouldn't be in this alone. So you can always count on me and on Minority Rights Group. Thank you so much for for all this time and for sharing sharing your very private story. Uh, let's stay in touch, Elahe. Thank you so much, Anna. Meeting you and people from MRG was one of those moments that I felt that I'm not alone. And thank you very much for being supportive and being yourself. It was such an honor to be here today. Thank you. Thank you.